They are good and merciful of them be pleasing God. Amen. Amen. So today, the chapter in the in the book today is on about worship, and I think it's sort of misunderstood. You know, it, 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 some years ago, I had uh, I think I told you how we served a memorial service for a boy who'd committed suicide. His parents were Pentecostal, or his uh, father was an, an, an Arab who'd become Pentecostal when he got married. And uh, the uh, funeral that they served for the boy was so distressing. And you wouldn't mention the boy's name or allow the coffin to be open, and they wouldn't go to the cemetery with the boy. So I practiced a little bit of a kunabiya, and the mother was really suffering a great deal. So the, uh, the grandmother, who was an Arab lady who went to the church I was serving, asked if we couldn't do something, so we served a memorial service. And uh, we did it at the end of the liturgy. So the uh, couple of Pentecostal people came to the liturgy and the memorial. And uh, afterwards, they decided to become Orthodox because, as the woman said, I, I, I realized I've never seen worship before. I've been going to church all these years, but I've never seen worship. And a little bit, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a little conference here on women in the ancient church. And one Protestant minister asked me to come to talk about the women in the ancient church for his congregation. So I went there on a Saturday night. And he said, well, we're going to have a brief worship service first. And well, sort of typical, they played some music on musical instruments and then they sang a few of what I would call feel good about myself songs. And uh, then a lady came out and she really sang a sort of a torch song. It had religious words, but it was what you'd call a torch song. But she had the sort of a jazz melody to it. And it was kind of astounding that people could call that sort of thing worship because it has very little to do with God. It has everything to do with the people. But uh, one of the songs was just, just the words over and over again. And they had a screen. Have you ever seen the screen with a little uh, ping pong ball bouncing over the words so you could sing it? And the words were, God is good, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good, God is good all the time. And there were no other words. That was it, the little ping pong ball was bouncing over the words. and. Uh, <coughs> I wanted at the time to say something about what worship actually is, but wasn't my place at that time. But uh, we, we have to think a little bit about the worship in the Orthodox Church. In, in the first place, the liturgy consists almost entirely of things directly from the scripture. There are two theological hymns, the uh, only begotten Word and Son of God, which was written by the Emperor Justinian, and it's a confession of faith. It's his confession of faith, and we sing that in the liturgy, the symbol of faith, which doesn't come directly from the scripture, and uh, a few verses that don't come directly from the scripture, but everything else, you'll find it somewhere in the scripture. And uh, so it's taken, uh, it's almost a complete exposition of the scripture and how we should understand the scripture. But it also draws us into something greater than just being in church and singing. It draws us into a, a real uh, con context of the heavenly kingdom and of the presence of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. And it's designed for that purpose. That uh, when we making everything we sing in church as a mutual confession of faith. And it unites us together uh, in a special way, where just plain singing doesn't exactly, because we're united in, in, in a con confession of faith. And uh, we sort of come in and we try, we don't always succeed, we try to sort of empty ourselves. That's why the Cherubic hymn says, uh, lay us all, or all earthly cares. And we strive to the best of our abilities to put aside all earthly cares and uh, to enter fully into 
realizing that the altar is a type of paradise and that we're all moving toward that open gate, toward paradise. And even as we grow older in life, it's still a type of the liturgy because as we grow older, we're still moving closer to the gates of paradise. We're still moving closer to departing from this life into the life of paradise. And uh, so the liturgy sort of matches life itself. And it sets um, a context to life itself. It also separates us from a kind of worldly surroundings and places us in a I mean, with the words, with the actions, with the incense, with <clears throat> it's, it speaks to all of our senses. Every one of our human senses is nourished in the liturgy. The, the sight of, <clears throat> you know, the sense of sound, sight, smell, a sense of speaking. And uh, so every aspect of our humanity is somehow spoken to in the divine liturgy. And it calls us into a, a, a comprehension of things that are not of this world, of things that are beyond this world. And uh, in a way, we, if we, the more we give ourselves over to it, the more we find ourselves sort of uh, embraced by the divine liturgy and embraced by the meaning of the liturgy and embraced by the gospel. Because the liturgy is the gospel lived in time. <clears throat> and I remember one of the great liturgists, uh, I think Cavasius, had commented that the divine liturgy was, it's older than the four Gospels. And the divine liturgy was the condensation of everything that the ancient church believed. So the, the understanding of the apostles and the first Christians is condensed for us in the divine liturgy. This is how they saw life. This is how they saw Christ. That's how they understood the heavenly kingdom. And so we're taken, in the liturgy, we're taken back to the very beginnings, the very foundations of the church, to what Apostle James was trying to convey when he wrote the, the first liturgy. And uh, we can see elements of the Old Testament passing into the New Testament. Because uh, we haven't forsaken the Old Testament. The, uh, you know, the, remember the, the Hebrew Torah, the holy book of the Hebrews, was kept in the, a, a niche behind the priest in the, in the uh, synagogues, in the temple, of course, it was kept in a more special place. And it's carried out, the fourth read, in procession. And then the Torah, uh, perhaps not everybody practices anymore, the Torah had to be unvested in front of the people. They would take off the royal raiment and it was wrapped in swaddling clothes, like a baby. And they would take the swaddling off and roll out the scroll and it would be read. Uh, so the four Gospels is our Christian Torah. It's the Christ that's why we keep it in the holy place. And it's kept on the holy table. Treated completely different than the apostle, letters of the apostles. Because this is the Torah for us. And it's, uh, if, if uh, one wants to put it that way, it would be the book of the law, because the law of the Lord is love, and, uh, but real love, not something uh, saccharine or romanticized, but uh, a real kind of love. And it's also the, the fact, even today when we do the prostrations, the Matanisa, the, uh, the fact that we understand to bow down to the before the Lord. It's a part of worshiping with our whole body. And we put our, our bodies into the worship. When we make the sign of the cross, we pray lifting up holy hands, because our hands are, are made holy by the sign of the cross. And uh, the, the, the scripture tells us to pray lifting up holy hands. Apostle Paul says that. So we, do, we fulfill that by making the sign of the cross. And every part of our person is involved in coming before God in it. Uh, even in most of the old countries anyway, people used to stand in prayer instead of sitting on benches. Because when you're standing, you're ready for, you're ready for something. When you're sitting, you're relaxing and you're not quite ready for something. But you're ready to proceed ahead.
you're ready to move forward. And if, I, if you will, you're ready to fight against the evil one. Because uh, standing is uh, opposed to readiness. And so every aspect of, of our divine worship has something to bring our entire personhood and, uh, and, and our inner person into the moment, into being present to God, to being present to Jesus Christ, and to being present to the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's, that's what true worship is concerned with, being present to Christ, being present to the Holy Spirit. And uh, when we, what we sing in the Divine Liturgy is teaching us, always teaching us something. It's very theological, even though it's easy to grasp theology, I suppose. But it, it's always instructing us, instructing our brains, instructing our hearts. And just participating in the liturgy instructs our hearts, but the words can instruct our brains, our minds, our, our intellect. And, uh, and we can gradually have that pass into our hearts, the fullness of our hearts. But worship is really emptying ourselves before, uh, before God so that we can be filled with something from God. We're not here to give something to God. We're here, you know, we talk about giving praise to God in the liturgy, but really we're not here to give, we're here to receive. We're here to receive of the Holy Spirit. We're here to receive of Holy Communion. We're here to receive the Word of God. And we're here to receive a fullness. And uh, we, we have to, everybody according to their strength, and you can't always do it, but to be truly present to God and present to the Holy Spirit. That, uh, that that's the, in this moment in the Divine Liturgy, there are moments when your mind drifts and moments when your line, life mind focuses. But when we hear the words and sing them both, they have a greater impact than if we listened to just someone sing them. That when we listen to a group singing or a choir, they're trying to be technically entertaining, they're trying to be technically perfect, and it impacts our emotions more than it, more than it impacts our souls. And we have emotional highs during the choir singing, and we have <clears throat> feelings of some kind of emotional lift. But when we're singing ourselves, we're actually worshiping. When we're not singing the liturgy, we're, I would like to say, listening to the choir worship. But the choir is not there to worship, they're there to entertain, and they're there to become technically uh, accomplished, so they can show what they've got to everyone. And so that, that uh, we try to avoid having just a few people sing, and especially having a professional group sing, because they're not concerned so much with the prayer as they are with the notes, with uh, seeing some fancy arrangements and trying to entertain everybody and show that they're, they're accomplished. And that's um, the one thing we have to remember because the singing that we do should be such that the words are draped over the music so that the words give form and shape to the music. If if the music gives shape and form to the words, very often the words are incomprehensible because when you get some of the arrangements, you can hardly even distinguish what the words are because they're being sung in such a manner. Uh, it's uh, something I noticed before when we had very accomplished choir singing. They'll distort the words to fit the music. And sometimes you can't even follow the words because they're distorted to fit the music. But it should be that the words actually shape the music, shape the way we sing them. When we're singing the hymns of the church, we should actually be thinking about the words and just using the music to give, uh, give voice to the words themselves. Because everything in the liturgy is prayer. None of it is entertainment. It's all prayer. And when we can, when we can manage to empty ourselves a little, so that we hear the words as well as sing them, and the words are taken into our minds and our hearts, and they can actually transform us if we listen and we pay attention. But sometimes we have to pay attention. So attentiveness is another part of worship. 
being attentive to the Word of God, being attentive to the words that have been given us in the liturgy, being attentive to the purpose of the Divine Liturgy, that we're all called together to receive Holy Communion. And Holy Communion is the center of the life of the Christian. It's the, 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 everything else is the framework that sets us to draw us toward Holy Communion to prepare us, to prepare our hearts for, for the moment of receiving Holy Communion. But the Eucharist itself is the purpose and center, central uh, accomplishment of the Divine Liturgy. And everything moves toward that moment of Holy Communion. And uh, Holy Communion from the very beginning, Christ made it the center of worship, and the Apostle Paul makes it the center of worship. And it's always been the very center of our worship, the very thing that we're trying to accomplish is the communion of, not we have the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, but the communion of the Holy Spirit, the communion of the Holy Spirit uniting us, and we have that hymn, the Holy grace of the Holy Spirit has united us today. And taking up our cross, we say, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. So the, be attentive and alert as we can, and be present to the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is drawing us together. And what is Christ trying to accomplish in our lives? But to spiritually nourish us so that we can see through to the end of life, so that we can have the kind of spiritual nourishment that will uh, sustain us uh, until the end of life. So well, that's, that's what true worship is really about. It, it, it's not accomplished by hearing a lecture from a priest or from, uh, and sometimes, you know, if you have to preach for an hour, you can't really say anything coherent. By the time you finish, everyone's forgotten what you started with. And uh, you have to tell jokes and tell little stories and make uh, funny comments during the sermon because it's going to last for 45 minutes to an hour. And sometimes that's where it gets hateful. When, they, when the, the priest's own heart is burning for the minister with some kind of hatred or some kind of fear or some kind of animosity that he has, it comes out in the servants. And you can hear it if you listen. But sometimes you just run out of things to preach about so you pick some social issue and you begin to spout hate and malice towards some social issue that's something in the world. And it's a time when we're here to cast aside all earthly cares and lift ourselves above the world and toward the heavenly kingdom. It's not a place to discuss social issues or social problems or even uh, things that you think are uh, going wrong in the world. That's a place to discuss the heavenly kingdom, to discuss Christ, to discuss the salvation of the soul, to discuss the grace of the Holy Spirit, to discuss those things which pertain to our salvation and our entry into the heavenly kingdom, our love and unity one for another, and uh, leave the things of the world for some other time. They don't belong in the liturgy. The sermon is liturgical, and uh, it's not something that's outside the liturgy or in addition to the liturgy. It's part of the liturgy, and it should follow the same pattern as the divine liturgy itself and the prayers that we're reading that day. We shouldn't bring, drag the world into it or any kind of uh, social concerns. Uh, you know, we don't have to encourage our parish to vote uh, conservative or to march on abortion clinics or to throw rocks at people in pride parades or anything like that. We need to worry about our own salvation and our entry into the heavenly kingdom and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the sole concern in the liturgy. Nothing else belongs. But, uh, so that's, that's not all I want to say. It's kind of hot today. I won't go on to but uh, anybody have any questions? Hmm? Um, the whole daily routine 
through starting with the first hour and going through all the way sure. to the end of the liturgy. Is that for like monastics made, was made for the monastics alone or is I guess it would be no, it's difficult to for... the degree that people can do it, that's fine. Uh, it, you know, we don't expect people who are working full time to do that sort of thing. But uh, the hours, first, second, third, uh, the, the first, the, yeah, the third, first, and third, and uh, sixth, and ninth, nine. are all geared to the hours that are mentioned in the gospel when Christ was being crucified on that day and when he was being betrayed. But they were the Roman, the, the hours when the Romans changed the guard. On the city walls, and that's why the first hour of the day was called cock crow because it started the rooster crowed at the same time the hour the watch started, so it got the common name of the the cock crow that day, and that's why when Christ tells Peter he'll deny him three times before the first hour of the day, is what he's actually saying. So the sunrise hour, and uh, the the the. Orthodox divine service is sort of like a clock that ticks to the life of Christ throughout the whole day. Mm. And, it, and it follows uh, the hours that are mentioned in Scripture. In the evening, uh, of course, the evening service, you know, what we call Vespers, is actually the name of it is lamplighting service. So we call it Vespers because Vespers means evening. Mm. And that's the only reason it's called evening service. So, uh, when we talk about the rumors, the, the time when we light the lamps in the temple is what it's about. And it's uh, the, the earliest mentioned divine service that's mentioned in the canons because uh, it was taken from the Old Testament temple when they would light the lamps in the temple just at the uh, evening light. And uh, we replaced the, uh, I don't know whether it was the uh, Golden Indri or which one they sang at the time, we replaced it with Oh Joyous Light. <coughs> and uh, it's the joyous light of the evening. Mm -hmm. So when we light the lamps. So that's uh, it's very ancient from the you know, it's, it's present immediately in the church because they maintained the lighting of the lamp service. So. But that's another aspect of worship too, that we follow the pattern of the life of Christ through the day and through the week and through the whole year with the 12 great feast days. But we're always like a clock ticking to the, to the life of Christ. We follow it. But Wednesday we fast because that's the day Christ was betrayed. Friday we keep fast because that's the day uh, he was crucified. And uh, sometimes we can't always observe that, but I remember one fellow who was in, married a Romanian woman, and we baptized him, and he said one time, he said, well, every time I see peanut butter, I think of Jesus Christ, because Wednesday and Friday, I get peanut butter sandwiches instead of, <laughs> instead of meat on my sandwiches. <laughs> uh, so uh, peanut butter always reminds me of Christ. <laughs> so, so things like that, right, have a way of sitting in, setting in, you know. Like our people would never, on the feast of the beheading of John Baptist, they would never cut anything with a knife. Mm -hmm. And especially they wouldn't cut a head of cabbage. <laughs> so that they, because they thought about what the day meant. Mm -hmm. And they thought, how could I acknowledge what the day means? It's by not cutting anything with a knife because they'll be heading to John Baptist. So uh, that's, I think that might be in other countries too, but certainly in Serbia. But uh, all those little things we do that sometimes the sectarians will say, oh, it's so formalistic. Yeah. You know, it follows a pattern. So we don't end up being scattered. And that we are not end up being scattered and confused amongst ourselves. So we follow a pattern of worship. There's a pattern to life that we try to set. And uh, it, it's, everything is done to for the purpose of somehow leading us toward an understanding, toward a comprehension and being present to what the day means. So that's that's part of worship. Anyway, anyone else? Okay. So in Creed we said, I confessed on baptism for the remission of the sins. Yeah. But what sins could the 
feel toward the child had? Well, it projects into the future. I mean, uh, the, the, your baptism for the remission of sins also that you're going to commit because we continue baptism for repentance. That uh, confession is just a continuation of baptism. But uh, we don't have to say, uh, we're, in, in the, at the time the uh, symbol of faith was written anyway, there were thousands of adults becoming Christians. And, uh, but we take the baptism as even for all future times as well. So, I mean, an infant doesn't have sins. Uh, when when, a, when a, an infant dies, we, give, we have actually what we call a funeral service for a saint, for, or for, uh, for an infant. That's actually, we, so we're, we're burying a saint on that day because they're pure and sinless. So that was uh, one of the great errors in the West. Augustine decided that everybody's born personally guilty of, of Adam's sin, and we inherit Adam's guilt. And uh, that's why uh, they came up with the doctrine of original sin. So, you know, unbaptized babies couldn't, couldn't be with God. They had to be they didn't have any personal sins, so they couldn't go to hell. They didn't have any, uh, but they were still guilty of original sin because they haven't been baptized yet. So they had to go to a cold, dark place called limbo. And uh, actually, when they asked St. Gregory of Nyssa what happens to babes like that, they said uh, they're in the hands of God, and what could be better? So it's uh, children, we, it's, yeah, children are sinless until, until they start uh, learning how to manipulate their parents. <laughs> <laughs> and they do, you know. <laughs> so, but uh, we're not baptizing infants for the remission of sins, but we don't baptize as many adults as they did at one time. They used to be baptizing hundreds of them at a time. You know, on, on uh, Great Holy Saturday, you'd sometimes have five or six hundred adults to baptize. So, that's anyway. I, I think it's worded a little bit difficultly in English anyway. Uh, I believe in Lord God the Father Almighty, and, but it's not quite clear whether you're saying that Jesus Christ is the maker of all things, visible and invisible or not, because of the way it's worded. I think we need a better punctuation. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else asked me, why do we say uh, that uh, Christ has risen again? But which, uh, in, in most languages, would mean that this is the second time he's risen because he's risen again. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just being, uh, in the English, it's just being restored to where he was before. So, anyone else? So, what about fear of God? How would we, I don't know, how would we interpret that? Cause well. It's love, but fear, or no fear, or... Well, it's, uh, it's not the kind of fear that is terror. It's just fear of separation, fear of loss. Fear of separation. I, I'd say it was like a child who gets lost in a supermarket, and no. is fear, uh, fearful of no. his parents. Mm. So, there are always, you know, there are consequences for things we do that are not necessarily God's punishment. It's some, some... Preachers, are, I guess some priests do, want to make everything a punishment by God. But some things just happen, that's all. But when we follow uh, a general pattern of Christian life, we don't, we don't uh, encounter all the same bad things, <laughs> but bad things happen. You know? So, it's, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, this time we should sing Heaven Making Comfort. Heaven Making Comfort, Spirit of Truth, Lord everywhere present, empty list all things, treasury of good gifts, and giver of life, come and abide in us, and cleanse us of Son and Holy 
Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, bloody God. God by His grace and love for mankind, always known ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.